Hello, my name is Dr. Sarah Charles, and this is the IAPR podcast. I'm here today with Suvi Maria Saralainen, who is an associate professor in the theology of well-being and working life skills at the School of Theology in the University of Eastern Finland. Her work has looked at a range of things, from how patients with life-threatening illnesses, such as cancer, cope with their sense of purpose and meaning, to researching spiritual well-being. This sits at the intersection between the psychology of religion and pastoral theology. That link between the psychology of religion and pastoral theology is actually a theme that came up multiple times throughout the 2023 IAPR conference in Groningen in the Netherlands. And so her work is likely to be very relevant to both attendees and speakers who came to that conference and members of the IAPR. And with that, I would like to say hello, Subi Maria. Hi, how are you today? Yes, I'm well, thank you. And how are you? Good. It's very nice to be here with you today. Yeah, it's lovely to have you. So one of the first questions I tend to ask a lot of the guests who come on is about their academic background and how it is they came to um, find out about and came to do research in the psychology of religion. So if you tell us a bit about your academic background and how you became interested in the field. Yes, thank you for asking. I think that's very uh, important uh, question for me also from the uh, perspective of, of career goals and and how how I am here where I'm today. And I'm a theologian as a background, uh, but already in very early years, I had this uh, dilemma whether I should go for the theology or to psychology. And and what comes out is is uh, being a scholar in psychology of religion, I guess. Um, uh, but uh, I've been in in pastoral theology for a major in, in my MA already. And in 2017, I finished my PhD about young adults coping with cancer and whether religiosity plays role in that. So I think it was already before I went to university, I had this dilemma psychology or theology and I, I think in in a very beautiful way they can be combined in psychology of religion. So you did your first degree was that at the University of Helsinki if I'm yeah. not mistaken and that was in theology? Yeah. And so how did you go from doing that degree in theology and how did you I guess become aware from that about the psychology of religion more generally? Mm. I think it's it was early 2000 I guess it was like 2005 or something like that when I was still doing my MA and started reading some Swedish scholars work and they referred to Pargament. Uh, at that time it didn't ring that much of a bell but when I started doing my PhD and, and I was trying to figure out a, a, a suitable theoretical framework that's how I found Kenneth Pargament's work. And of course, I was thrilled. There is this whole new world that kind of opened it up for me. And it was 2013 IAPR meeting when I attended for the first time. And I was like, oh, wow, this is my academic home. I really feel like home in, in this conference. And I found that people are very much in a similar field. And it, it was like uh, finding a new world in, in so many levels when attending to IAPR for the first time. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic that it's been over 10 years now since you first attended the IAPR conference for the first time and, you know, suddenly feeling like you had an academic home, uh, which actually, now that you said that, it's one of those things that I experienced as well. Yeah. When I was do when I was doing my PhD, it was during my PhD that I came to the IAPR for the first time. And at that, that conference, I, I went into the 2019 conference in Gdansk as my first one. And I suddenly met a bunch of researchers like, oh, wow, this is also my academic home. And so yeah. it's lovely to find someone else who's had that experience as well, turning up and saying, yeah. oh, suddenly I, I have an academic home when, yeah, this and work it, can often lead yeah. to the intersection of, of different uh, different roles. You know, are you in psychology? Are you in theology? Are Indeed. you in other things? So that's really nice to hear. Yeah. And, and for me, it was like eye opening because I was doing uh, cancer and, and religious coping studies and actually see so many. Well, there was many Scandinavian scholars, but also many people in the similar uh, with a similar research interest. So it was very, very fruitful in that sense as well. Yeah. So that, that actually leads me quite nicely on to asking about your work uh, on yeah. patients who have life threatening illnesses, especially cancer is, is one of the major areas that you worked in, as you just mentioned. Um, so what is this, what is it that prompted your interest in religious coping as as a 
focus of interest of yours? Well, I think originally in my PhD, I was interested whether religious city plays a part in, in coping processes of young adults, because it's it's a huge topic, whether what, what is the religious city or spirituality of, of this younger generation. And for me, it was qualitative study, narrative study. So the population was quite small, but still it was interesting that within these 16 in the uh, narrative interviews, I could see that nearly all of them asked asked why would god allow even though they would say that they are not that that religious so i was uh, able to dig in deep that what is this religious city that they kind of seem to interact in their cancer coping process and later on i've been working uh, also with uh, older patients and and whether re- what kind of religious city they are affiliated with because it's kind of considered that Well, these older generations, they do believe how church teaches, but that is not the case. They actually have very different worldviews, which is very interesting as well. So I think having these various generations talk about their religious city, which is, I think, every time something different that we would assume. So that's how I got uh, more and more uh, involved and in this topic and why cancer specifically. Hmm. I think it's it's very uh, interesting in that sense that I'm not sure whether in everyday life we would stop and take a hold and consider how many people around us are actually affected by cancer. In Finland, it is that every third person gets cancer during the lifetime. So that's a huge pop- amount of population. And, and that means that we all m- basically know people quite close to us who are or will be affected by cancer. So I think it's societally very important that we know how to support these people in in very holistic way. You've already answered some of the questions that I have <laughs> coming in. So that's really, really a, a really beautiful answer. So based on what you've just said, I'd actually like to ask, what were some of the things that you thought going in that you would hear from so either the younger adults or the, the older generation that you didn't hear or vice versa, the things that you did hear that you didn't expect? What are some of those things? Yeah, well, for the young adults, I was surprised how much prayer meant to them, but also that they came up with these individual rituals, like carrying these angel figures or or going to the woods and finding spiritual uh, experience in in forest, for instance. That's very Finnish, but still it was uh, the level of of intensity of those experiences that was uh, amazing or surprising. For older people, I think it was interesting, for instance, because there's this huge uh, idea that older people, religious city is something more, I don't know, fundamental or, or following church official teachings. And and in some of the interview meetings, I realized that there's a participant was kind of hesitating. And then I said that, please feel free. It's okay. You can say whatever you feel like. And and then they started saying, but but you are a theologian. And I said, no, 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 don't worry. I'm, I'm here as a researcher. And then they might start this discussion that, well, actually, I'm not a believer in that sense, or I am a believer, but I have my ber- personal belief, or I, I believe that uh, to the second birth or something like that. So it was very, I think, all in all, uh, narratives of the older people were surprisingly similar than narratives of the younger persons. And we wouldn't, I haven't never combined this, but I think it would be very interesting to see similarities because it's against of all the odds that what you would expect when you go and uh, in the interview situation with these people. That's very interesting that you, even though that we consider in this um, field, we consider the younger generation to be less religious, I think, yeah. than the older generation. So to hear that they have very similar ways of religious coping. Is it at a similar rate as well? Is it the same, roughly the same number of people that you would say in the older and the younger generation? I would assume still that when going to quantitative stuff that we would see the difference. We have now studied with quantitative methods, sources of meaning and meaning in life. And of course, we can see that the intensivity and, and like the significance of religion is higher among older people than it is among younger people. So so perhaps in numbers, our understanding is still that younger generation is less religious. Perhaps spirituality is there in different ways. And of course, we can also see that existential issues are 
universal and well they are uh, important for all the people in in all the generations thank you for talking about your work on 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 that religious coping and i do find it very interesting that at the very least the way in which both sets of populations that you've looked at do engage with religious coping in similar ways even though that goes against what you thought going in and i think that's useful for any listeners here that, that just because you think something going in even if something doesn't match your hypothesis if you go in thinking one thing and you find something different that's worthy of note and in fact can be more interesting sometimes than if your thoughts going in are confirmed yeah yeah that's true and so you mentioned something there at the end about the existential feelings that being cancer patients brings up and i was wondering if you could touch on some of your work that you've published on existential loneliness and Mm. the work that i think that you've been doing a bit more recently on that construct existential loneliness could you explain for our listeners what you mean by existential loneliness because it's a term that some people may not have come across before and then based on that what it is that you've been doing when researching existential loneliness yes that's true currently uh, i have a project uh international project where i'm working to Together, for instance, with Jesse de Zutter uh, and also uh, Helena Larsson and, and Gerrit Hogan, we have been studying all of people's experiences on existential loneliness. Particularly, we've been focusing on uh, experiences uh, which emerge in the uh, nursing home setting, in these facilitated uh, living conditions. And in this case, well, theoretically, we draw much from Yalom. And, and Yalom talks about existential isolation, but when talking about existential loneliness, basically we mean isolation that is felt when discovering the deep awareness of being fundamentally separated from other people and from the universe. And when that causes suffering, then existential loneliness is experienced. So in that theoretical uh, setting we've been working on and, and together with uh, meaninglessness, as well. And we've been studying the connection between meaninglessness and existential loneliness and whether they are separate concepts or how do they overlap. Recently, we just recoded one data that was gathered in in Sweden, uh, originally focusing on existential loneliness, and we coded how meaning in life can be found in there. And then we have another uh, study where we do the vice versa. So, and, and we can actually see that these to they are separate but interactively experienced in a in a level of, of individual. So for the older people living in, in nursing home setting, there are several uh, factors that cause these well deeply existential agonizing feeling. First of all, more often moving into nursing home, it's not selection of an individual. It is forced life situation. So already that transition is likely to cause barriers of of existential issues. And and when being kind of like your whole identity is being stripped, uh, you have to move in. Perhaps you had an apartment or a house before and all of a sudden you have a room or shared room and you are there all by yourself. You don't have your stuff or perhaps you can have some something little from your previous home. You can, in best case, take your clothing with you. So it is quite extreme that change. And we also interviewed just recently the carers. And I was uh, leading this work package where we interviewed chaplains in nursing homes. And how do they feel their competence of, of caring these existential issues among older people? So, so yes, we've been studying both experiences of the older person, but also the experiences of carers and whether carers know how to support. That's really interesting to get both sides of that and to understand that existential loneliness is itself an interesting construct, but as, as you said, that how it might interact with a similar but distinct construct of, of, of meaninglessness. And I, I think that actually might sit well with a lot of researchers in the area who have been looking at you know, the relationship between loneliness more generally and well-being. Mm. And so hearing that, that, you know, you can put this in a more almost spiritual context and have an existential loneliness construct might be of interest to other people in the field. And, you know, I think uh, Suvi's work is very interesting. And, and I think other people who are listening, if they're interested in this existential loneliness idea and how it can be understood 
in relation to meaninglessness and also from both the experiences perspective but also how carers you know interact with that I, I think it's really worth reading and it, I thoroughly enjoyed reading your work over the, the last many years you know when I first came across your research but um, I, I think for those who aren't aware of your work it's definitely worth reading if they are in any way shape or form interested in in that relationship between say loneliness and well-being which has become with a lot of news around the world you know in, coming out of America coming out of the UK coming out of Europe you have a lot of the relationship between loneliness and well-being and and, and the loneliness epidemic this kind of news mm. further about it so this is another way to I guess uh, assess loneliness in in, in a novel construct of existential loneliness mm. yeah that kind of re- reminds me that I think one of the probably one of the the only good thing that came out of COVID was that during the first COVID wave people were so afraid of of older people and whether they are abandoned at their houses so that for a short period of time old older people actually felt that they were more supported because there were so many like neighborhood help and that kind of network appeared that haven't been there before. I think in most of the cases, those networks are gone now, but there was this short period of, t- of time that we were more conscious about the level of loneliness of older people and, and how they can be supported at their individual houses. So, hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that might be something that people come back to in future and, and consider as something that's vitally important, possibly, of, of that um, I guess, community network to help stem yeah. that feeling of loneliness, not just in the elderly, but also in in people of all ages, you know, with reports of loneliness increasing in younger generations, not just old generations as of late. Um, I had a question that I would actually really like to ask you, but I hadn't planned to ask you for the part yeah. of this podcast. Well, I've got you. Uh, you've done work, obviously, in Sweden, but also in Finland. And something that some listeners might not know is that uh, so Scandinavia is quite often kind of stereotyped to being a fairly non-religious region of the world by comparison Mm. to you know other parts of the world but Finland tends to I guess buck that trend somewhat Finland tends to be more religious than its neighbors especially I think there's a large Lutheran population I think that's in fact it might be the largest religious group in Finland Lutherans and so I wonder have you experienced a difference in your research of doing work in Sweden which is I guess more culturally non-religious mm. especially in the last 15 20 years it's become more um more not necessarily atheistic but more non-religious in nature in Sweden but compared to Finland which is still somewhat quite religious by comparison mm. oh that's a very interesting question especially now that we know that Currently in Finland, what is rising is religiosity of young males. It's a huge trend at the moment, and it's it's not like and they are they are conservative, conservative Christianity is it is in a rise at the moment, and I think it goes quite well with a right wing political idea. Also, perhaps not well. A lot could say a lot could be said on that, but that's something that we currently see in the Finnish religious conversations. But whether I see difference between Sweden and Finland, it's hard to say because I've been working with the data of older people and there are sim- so much similarities in there. But I think that's something we hope to see that in the studies near near future hope fingers crossed for the (laughs) grant application because we would love to see more comparative work done between nordic countries but also larger northern western europe what is similarities and differences for instance sweden norway finland uh, netherlands belgium in these areas because in in one way it's so easy to say that northern europe is secularized And then again, it's not. Or if people are taking steps away from the official church, still spirituality or this larger lived religion type of setting tend to remain. So what is it? What are the key values, core values that remain as a meaningful, whether it is not an institutional religiosity? What is it then? And and that's fascinating. All right. Um, You also 
very very lightly touched on the kind of work that you'd yeah. like to do in the future so yeah. you're preempting a lot of my questions and I really like it because it makes my job quite easy so thank yeah. you yeah. <laughs> um so I was I was going to ask and, and the listeners can and now hear more about the future work that you have planned so you say that you're getting ready to put in a grant to do some more of that comparative work I was wondering would you be looking to compare specific countries or is it as many as you would as, as you can possibly get a hand of is your goal I want to look at culture A versus culture B, or is it, I would like to see as many countries as possible in this study and use that data how we see fit? Is what? How are you planning on approaching that? Yeah, if I had all the millions in the world, then I would not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would well, be nice. Yeah, that would be nice. But I would love to see some sort of a, a more advanced theoretical framework. I think it's, it's quite, to be able to, to form like a theoretical grid, for instance, existential, spiritual, religious well-being, they are quite tend to be culturally bound. I think there there will always be cultural differences, and that's something that we will have to take into consideration. But I think it would be nice to see how far you can stretch. If starting now from Scandinavia or or from Northern Europe, how far that same theoretical framework is still relevant and where are the boundaries and what ha- what tra- trajectories or factors change i don't know i think that's something that i'll spend the rest of my life studying <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I, I and i look forward to reading all of that work because mm. I, I i think in fact when people come up with theoretical frameworks and are able then to use that framework as a method to build new research that's often what I find most interesting in the area because suddenly then you can create new questions from that theoretical framework. Given, given that you've now created this framework, that, that, I guess, creates new suggestions, things that we should find based on that framework. But also it, it can pose more questions of, OK, well, if this is the framework that we've put up, what, why is that the case and not some, something else? And, and so uh, I look forward to reading more about your work going forward, about your construction of this theoretical framework and and how you plan on, on growing that theoretical framework and its application over time. Yes, well, we'll have to uh, wait and see what happens. Yes, um, but speaking of waiting and seeing what happens, uh, I think, um, you know, Sufi Marie, as, as she's just said, is is very happy to, to look at uh, comparing uh, things across countries. So if you're if you're not from Northern Europe necessarily, but you have similar research interests to Suvi, I would recommend getting in touch with her. She's very friendly. Um, she's a very very um, strong academic. Um, from reading her work, it's always very interesting. So I, I think it would be um, you know possibly fruitful for everyone involved if you are from a different um, part of the world and you want to study something similar, looking at. Um, either ex, you know be existential loneliness or religious coping in um, people who are suffering with cancer or some other form of life-threatening illness and you'd like to work along with Suvi I'm sure um, she would uh, be happy to hear from you and you know you could extend that theoretical frame- framework beyond the reaches of northern Europe. Indeed that would be super to hear more about colleagues working in the same field. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I, I really wanted to get you onto this podcast, because I think your work is is brilliant. And I think one of the things that we have access to is, part, you know, being an international association is that we have listeners not just from Europe, but we have listeners from all over the world, be the from North America, from South America. Um, you know, there's um, the, the contingent that we've now got that I've known for a bit longer who are in um, Australia and New Zealand. And so I think it would be really lovely to have that um, collaboration, that intercontinental collaboration Indeed. in the field more frequently, because mm. uh, something that has happened in the past is this, the work that we do as, I guess, a field of the psychology of religion is that it can be quite localized. Mm. It can often be considered, you know, it happens very much either contained into a single country or is sometimes contained to single religions. A lot of it is based in Christianity, for example. And so being able to have access to researchers from other parts of the world can enable us to have interesting discussions about if that framework holds in other parts of the world. Indeed. Yeah. 
you are definitely right. Thanks. I'm glad that that's the case. <laughs> it, it, it's good to, to have someone of, of your caliber think so. So um, on that note, uh, I'd like to ask you if there's anything that we haven't spoken about that you'd like to talk about, be it about work that you've got planned in the future, but planned uh, work that you have, that you're working on right now that you think that other people should hear about? Is there anything that you'd like people to hear about? Hmm. Well, we've been talking about quite many areas already. I think what we haven't been, we've been talking about serious cancer, but we have perhaps not been talking about that much about palliative care and, and, the, what, at the, and the bereavement part. Uh, that's a whole nother <laughs> set of, of research, but I, I just uh, finalized a chapter. It was linked to my PhD, but uh, about young people coping with cancer and particularly about palliative care of younger people. And I think that's when I realized we ran a literature review on uh, existing papers, and that's a huge gap. So perhaps this is like an invitation to research that if you consider what area of study really needs to be studied, it's it's young people, adolescent and young, young adults, palliative care. There's such a scarce amount of papers available. So that's like something that uh, one, someone might be interested of, of studying in the future. Uh, but also I, I do consider while it is important to study meaning in life, uh, I think life should be worth of living in the last breath of, of life. So therefore all the palliative care studies uh, are important as well. And we've been studying also with qualitative methods about palliative care, but, but also a be bereavement of, of those who are then left alone. And I think there are lots of things that should and could be done to enhance the well-being of, of bereaving individuals as well. So perhaps just very shortly. <laughs> yeah, no, something. I, please, mm. please do. Um, so on that note, you were talking about palliative care there. And it's something that I, I guess I brushed upon when you, when I mentioned about, you know, life ending illnesses, but Indeed, yeah. um I think it would be really, really nice to hear more about the work that you've done on those not just suffering with like threatening illnesses, but people who are in end of life care, people who are in palliative care, um, who, you know, they they just are towards the end of their life, whatever their age is. And um, you've done work on understanding their perspective, but also, as you mentioned, the, the bereaved parties. Could you explain um, some of the work that you've been doing in that area and also mm. um, out, you know what what's interesting findings what well, at least findings that you find interesting and yeah. I'm sure other people can go away and take on your call that you've just mentioned of doing further research in the area hmm. well perhaps instead of going to specific findings I think what was very in inspiring in our home-based palliative care project was the visual methods that we used and I also used something in, in my PhD uh, but in this uh, home-based palliative care project, we had this PICTOR method. So we asked people to uh, kind of map their relationships, support networks with the post-it notes. So it was like an icebreaker and, and because interviews might be frightening for, for participants and kind of laying out this visual assignment, it, it is like an icebreaker. It's more, more easier to kind of enter to the discussion and to the topics. But I think visual methods can provide new layers, whether it's post-it notes or in, in my PhD, uh, I ask participants to draw, uh, consider that what if their life so far would look like a tree, what would it look like? So it, it always brings something new. It brings something that you as a researcher were not expected to see, and it adds up these kind of like it takes an edge from the power relations that are easily in the in the interview situations because if you go in with the visual methods none of the people in the room knows what will happen next so so it's it's nice uh, but it also provides an the participant an opportunity to kind of reword what have happened and for the bereaved people they often find found out, okay, I have this support here. They could see 
notes coming to the paper. So perhaps it was like, OK, so I'm not alone. Or some of them said that, well, this was too much. This person doesn't fit to the actual paper or I should have someone. And, and it also helps the participants themselves to consider that what is going on in their life at the moment. So it's been interesting. That's that's very, very interesting, in part for me, because I have in the last couple of years of my work moved into a, a kind of away from the biological side of the psychology that I'm interested in towards a, a slightly more social side. And in that they do something called social identity mapping, where yeah. they, they use things like post-it notes or more recently online tools to map their social support networks, the, the yeah. groups that they identify with. And so it's interesting to see that that kind of methodology can be used in the psychology of religion and in that kind of visual elicitation kind of task and that that kind of more qualitative research as well. And so it's always nice to hear when you can hear similar methods being used across disciplines. Mm. When you have, you know, it's not just um, in my area of, you know, in this area of social psychology that I've recently been in, but also um, using that kind of post-it note, that social network mapping, the support network yeah. mapping. And as you were saying, the visual methods, which have been used in, in various ways in the past, I've seen now, um, are, are also, you can use them to great effect in the psychology of religion. So it's important that I think in the psychology of religion, we use a lot of quantitative methods, especially correlation-based methods. So it's really nice to see qualitative methods um, and you know not just interview techniques but visual techniques being used more and that might be something that people who are in the area might be interested in reading more about your work on that front yeah yeah i think it's it's important to i think we need various type of methods to to be able to to comprehend fully or better <laughs> these uh, topics that we're talking about. But I, I do think that there is a, definitely the value in, in both qualitative and quantitative and also in mi mixed methods. I think that's an important findings can be discovered. And on that note, I think I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do want to thank you so much for taking part in, in this podcast series. And for anyone who does want to go away and read some more of Suvi's work, I strongly recommend it. And uh, the last thing I have to do is thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Brilliant. All right. Have a nice day. You too.